Hi, and thank you so much for coming. Um, this is a really big night, and I'm just so excited to introduce Alexia today. I think you can judge the character of a person uh, quite well by how they touch their family and their friends. And I'm going to tell you, if you know Alexia, you know that by that standard, she is one remarkable person. Soon after Alexia and I met, we started doing what all moms do, start talking about our children, um, and started engaging uh, in conversation, and she told me, I found out that Hillary, her daughter, runs Boulder Green Streets. Um, her grandson is over at Stanford studying and has already started his first startup, and her granddaughter is over in London and pursuing a career in international environmental activism. And still in school, she has grants and job offers. Lexi not only wrote this book, she really lives these values. And I am just thrilled to hear more about it tonight. And I ask you to welcome Alexi with me to her talk tonight. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you all. So let's begin. Hardwired, the 10 major traits of women hardwired by evolution, and I say here, that can save the world. Because um, we truly are endowed by Mother Nature with natural leadership traits. And you'll see that tonight. And I say it's the new science of a woman's brain because um, these traits, and I, we developed 10 traits in the book, and they're explained in the book, just so happen to be the 10 traits of what I would call a, the leader, natural leadership traits, the traits of a great leader. And they just so happen to be the very opposite of those hardwired in you men. So how many men do we have here in the audience? We have a lot of men. But there's no right or wrong. It's not that men are better than women or women are better than men. It's just that as you'll see as the story unfolds, that they were hardwired differently for different tasks. And that's what makes it so important. That's why this complementary opposites is really what we, we see in this picture that's unfolding. But today, in the 21st century when we have 60% of women now making up the student body in universities, 70% of the student body in college campuses are women, 72% of the class valedictorians in 2011 were women. Women are moving into leadership just by the fact that they're showing up, they're being educated in, in great numbers. For 99.9 percent of human history, virtually all of human history, humans lived outdoors in nature. The stars overhead were our, our roof and the dirt or the earth of the floor was our floor. And conditions were harsh. When it was sunny it was great, when it was cold and windy or rainy it was hard living. You all know that we were hunter-gatherers. What you may not know is the astonishing fact that humans for 99.9 .9 percent of their life lived only 25 years men and women, which means that during those 25 years, men had to be successful at becoming hunters. They had to go out and hunt for food, and they only had the 25 years to do that. Likewise, women had to stay around the hearth, around the fire, and again, only 25 years to be able to, at the age of puberty, begin to give birth to children, um, nursing, tending ch small children, because at age 25, women and men walked off the stage of life. 10,000 years ago, we encountered the agricultural revolution. So all of a sudden, we went from being um, egalitarian to hierarchical. Men went off to work. They plowed the fields. They did the rough work. Took a lot of muscle and energy and, and testosterone. The women stayed home with the children. All of a sudden, we went to the fact where there was constant food, enough food for everyone. So populations exploded. If we want to look for one of the answers, in six hotspots around the world, populations exploded because now there was enough food. You never had to go out to look for food. It was right there at your doorstep. And complexity multiplied. If you think of all the social systems, the jails, the court systems, the rules, the regulations, the organized religions, everything had to be organized to keep people from bumping into one another and stepping on one another's toes and territory. Everything from that 10,000 point forward changed except our hardwired brain. And the image that I'm showing here of this iceberg is that 80% of the human brain, both men and women, is hardwired. And when 
we are under stress, both men and women, what rises to the surface is that hardwired brain, which is a lot of times why when we're dealing with social issues, we're trying to figure out, you know, what he says, what she says, why we say this, why they do that. We're dealing with the very top of that, the tip of the iceberg, when what we really should be looking at is that 80% that's hardwired. Look at the analogy of a dog. You can train them to sit, to stay, to roll over, to be a good dog. But show that dog something that is irresistible, a squirrel or a deer or something <laughs> fierce, and it's going to break its command and it's going to run. When you're a man out there on a hunt, you may find that you can't express emotions if you're up close and personal to an animal and you have to look it in the eye and kill it. So this over 99.9% .9 of human history, men had to have that role of suppressing their emotions because they had to kill in order to bring food back. We always think of men loving power and maybe women, whatever. Uh, it turns out it's tools, technology, inanimate objects that you can take apart. You think of a man in a workshop pulling things apart, putting them back together. With women, it's just the opposite. With women, you are absolutely endowed by Mother Nature with natural leadership skills. The social mind is one. When a baby's born, the first thing, you know, unless you have ultrasound, the first thing that they do is they hold the baby up and they say, is it a boy or a girl? That's the primary um, characteristic, whether it's sex is a boy or a girl. But the one that dominates our story here is the secondary characteristic, and that is, in the men, it's the testosterone for strong, dense bones, that aggressive risk-taking behavior. With women, the oxytocin and the estrogen are an important story. The very first suckling of the baby on the mother's breast, the breast milk, triggers a release from the pituitary gland of oxytocin. And that creates, that first suckle and that first chemical release creates the lifelong bonding, the mother-child bonding, which is why a mother will lift up a car or a tree to save her child. And by extension, that goes to her, all of her children and to her family and her community. That bonding is hardwired and strong. Empathy, also women have nonverbal skills of being able to look at someone, tell by a change in their face, or how they look, you know, they will lean for you know, what is the matter, they'll reach out to help. This is hardwired in women because they were having to depend upon each other for the survival of their young children. Touch, again, that homophobia in the Western culture, this is not true in other cultures, but it is true with men in this culture for the, a large part. But with women, they're constantly touching, constantly you know, holding hands or hands around each other or embracing. Men were trained to kill. They had to go out and find that, that animal and bring it back as food. So you find that trajectory from the bow and arrow, you know, the handheld stone to the bow and arrow, to the weapons of war, to the bomb, to the bomber, to the drone. These are all expressions of that first slingshot and bow and arrow. As men t turn that love of technology and one hand in ways to kill, but on the other, just creating the world that we live in today. Men have brought us, you know, a lot of what we look at because of that love of technology and tools. Now, we tend to think of fight or flight as applying to everyone, but it's truly hardwired in men. Men have to go out and in a nanosecond, they um, assess, is this something that I can approach and kill or tackle, or am I gonna have to run away? With women, it's opposite. If you think of 25 years, not 75 years, but 25 years for 99.9% .9 of their life, they could not grab their children and run from danger. So they had those who were successful and those who survived developed a whole different strategy for uh, diffusing danger. And so that became diplomacy, negotiation, you know, have a, have a bowl of soup, have a sandwich, you take the thorn out of the paw, whatever it took to diffuse that danger those who were successful survived and their children survived because they had a whole different situation. They had babies and they were pregnant. Men have brought us this far and they have a, a role to do. Imagine if women envision a sustainable world and men help create that. Men have the, the, the compatible roles with women, but women need to move forward into the visionary roles that they have and the leadership roles that they have. In Congress, I was shocked to learn that women got their vote, right to vote in 1920 to date, only 277 women have made it into Congress versus 12,000 men. So it's not that it's, it's, it's the conversations are different. Imagine if you had women, more women in the conversation, more, more women in the mix, more women 
leading the way. If more women were in government, enough to make a difference, the monies of government, government monies, would shift away from tanks, war, and weapons in the direction of education, health care, infrastructure, the eradication of poverty, and sustainability. The 56% initiative is basically shifting, um, creating like a tipping point, 50-50 but your thumb on the scale, just to do the tipping point. People say, why 56%? The United States, as I mentioned, only 277 women have entered Congress, the U.S. Congress, over the last 92 years versus 12,000 men. With Congress, we'd actually like to see that shift. We'd actually like, by the year 2020, to get to 56% in Congress. In the world of business, because it's not just politics, it's business, we just like it to be as a symbol for businesses to say, we want to inspire more women. And believe it or not, because so many women are now, I mean, the majority are now women in college, as I said, 60% in universities, 70% in community colleges, 72% class valedictorians, it is beginning to tip, and they are the ones coming out asking for jobs and managerial jobs. And it's going to happen automatically in business, but we're using that as like a, a target. If you put that up on your business, it says, we want to empower women. Thank you. Thank you.